nonpartisan. So right. as I comment, I'm going to comment on this, uh, for, uh, you know, just in general political terms. Um, I think that uh, although it's a long shot, there is a path for the Republicans in both the House and the Senate uh, to at least become competitive, if not have an, a, a tumultuous, earthquake-shattering uh, overturn of the Democratic control. Because I think this is very much like, I think we're heading towards something that could be very much like 1994 or even 2006 when the Democrats took control of the House and Senate uh, of Congress. Because the body politic out there, the average person out there who normally is a surface skimmer politically, is not surface skimming. They are digging in and they are paying attention in a way that they have not done in years. The whole sort of insider game, the, the history, cultural history of corruption in Illinois can only work when the, the taxpayers and voters are doing well economically. Mm -hmm, when mm -hmm. prosperity prevails, people don't pay as much attention because they're bringing home enough money, they're being able to live the lifestyle they want. But when things tank as they have tanked and things get to the tipping point in taxation, people start to pay attention. That's what the tax day tea parties were about. That's why there's so, the, the kind of, um, what I call over the transom interest we get from people we've never heard of before. Frankly, the donors that are coming to us that we've never heard of before, and God knows I love those folks, uh, are writing checks unlike anything we've ever seen. And it's because the insider game has failed. It, got, it, it helped Chicago weather the storm of the 60s and 70s and the early 80s. The old way of doing things kind of worked if you look at what happened in Cleveland and Detroit. But that's no longer true. We're in a world economy, and the old way, the Chicago way, the corrupt way, no longer works, and people get that. But you know what concerns me? If we look at the uh, local uh, election cycle that just unfolded in April of 2009 for school districts, for township governments, for municipal government races, only 18 percent of the registered voters on average came out mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. Cook County to vote. And this is where your real estate taxes are really spent. Uh, Cook County is only about 12 percent of a uh, real estate tax bill, mm -hmm. uh, your local elementary, middle school, and right. college, right. plus your municipal tax on your real estate tax is over 65% of your but taxes. Tony, that's a very important point, but as you know better than anybody, elections are always about who turns out, not how many turn out. Right. So, uh, you know, turnout rates are always notoriously low in this country. So the question is, the people that turned out in those municipal elections, what did they do? And what they largely did is turned out longtime incumbents. There was absolutely a rejection of incumbents in a bunch of municipal elections, Northbrook and some others that you might know better than I do in Cook County, as well as around the state. And the 94 uh, election was about who turned out, the 2006, the 2008 election was all about who turned out. If the independent voters of this state, this county, this city, and the disaffected conser economically conservative voters turn out in 2010, there will be a revolution. Yeah, I think, I think 2010 is going to be a very significant year. I, I do agree with what John says about the possibility of a Republican resurgence. Why? Because in Illinois, we are dominated, as you've pointed out many times, state, county, local, by Democrats. And so they're the ones who are in office. And I think there's a throw the bums out feeling right. that's, that, is, that is growing across the board. Uh, from the southern part of Illinois all the way to the northwest right. in Galena throughout Cook County. And in terms of turnout rates, I think if you see a, a, a small increase in 2010 over what other off-year, non-presidential year turnouts have been, you could have very dramatically different results. Yeah, very I, dramatic. I actually went back uh, when I decided to get involved. Uh, I'd worked nationally in doing uh, my uh, public policy work, uh, and I decided to get involved in Illinois in the spring of 2007. I actually went back and looked at every race by district, House and Senate, all 118 House uh, districts and all 59 Senate districts from 2000 through, at that time, 2006. And with a couple of, you take out a couple of the anomalies, those races were much closer than people realize. And when some of those seats flipped, they were much closer. So this idea of this huge dominance in much of these races is true in terms of the numerical superiority of the Democrats right. in the House and Senate. But if you actually break down those races, they're much tighter than people realize. Many of those races are competitive, and people seem to have forgotten that. The other thing is I just want to mention very quickly is, so if there's an opportunity, how do you take advantage of it? Mm -hmm. So if I was in charge of the Republican Party, my strategy would be to have a very clear differentiating agenda focused on two simple ideas ethics reform and spending reform you know the t and of course no tax increase which is a given but the but the key to this and i think what people want what we're hearing those tax day tea parties were not about people being overtaxed right. they're about this the prolific spending out of control spending when they're the only ones being held accountable mm -hmm. i want to talk about that uh, uh, juxtaposition between the republican and democratic elected officials at the local uh... county and 
state levels. But uh, before I get into that, I want to again remind our viewers to please take a look at our website, parika.com, where we have a lot of information about these issues, as well as uh, contact us by phone at 773-735-1700. How can we provide that kind of a clear distinction between the democratic fiscal and social policies versus the Republican, let me finish my question, yeah, Republican yeah. social and fiscal policies, when, for example, and you're a transportation expert, Chris, when the RTA tax was uh, raised to fund CTA, rescue CTA from its financial bankruptcy uh, at the behest of Mayor Daley, the three senators who provided the deciding vote to increase the sales tax in suburban Cook County and the mm -hmm. Collar Counties were three Republicans, Dillard, Milner, and uh, Cronin. How, how, how can we distinguish ourselves as fiscal conservatives when the Republicans are providing the vote to increase taxes? The, the primary voters of those three senators' districts are going to have to deal with those senators. There, there isn't any, you know, we don't have a parliamentary system. We cannot discipline them uh, externally. But I agree with you that we as Republicans, and, and I'm, a, I'm here, I'm a Republican activist, I'm, I'm not with a nonpartisan group like John is, I have been telling Republicans every chance I get that we've got to have a, a simple, clear distinction between ourselves and the Democrats. I agree with John, no new taxes, a, a very close look at cutting this budget statewide, cutting the county budget. These budgets have been inflated by insiders at the expense of the rest of us. Right. And the Republican, you're, one, you're a very glaring and blessed exception in that you've gone to the county and you have held up the light and said, this is what's going on. Some Democrats have tried to catch up to you in doing that. But the fact is, we need that kind of approach at every level of government, whether it is in a township or it's in a municipality, if it's at Cook County or it's down in Springfield, we've got to shine a light on this and we've got to say no more taxes and we're going to take another look at these budgets. But, uh, well, ahead, let, me, let me address the, the question you asked uh, that Chris just uh, answered because I think it's an important point here. No caucus, Democrat or Republican, in any state in this union at the state level has unanimity all the time. They're all, the whole strategy of the other side is trying to get 51, uh, 51 percent to peel off some votes. The Democrats successfully peeled off those votes you talked about. The question is, what does leadership do about that? Mm -hmm. How does leadership respond? And it's incumbent upon the leaders, whether it's an individual leader that's uh, trying to put himself out there as a leader for the future of, the, of his party, or whether it's the caucus leader, in the case of the Republicans, Tom Cross and Chris Rodonio, it's what they say about it that matters. And if they put out a, a, an unhappy message with those people who abandon ship on, on not voting for that tax, and then by voting for that tax increase, and, and brand their party for the ideas that we would advocate, which are less discipline on spending, lower taxes, reforming a regulation to make this a business-friendly pro-growth environment, that brand will get out there in spite of those individuals who bail out. And That's the key. And I've got to emphasize on the transportation merits, there were none. There were none. Mm -hmm. right. There were no transportation merits to that bailout plan. That bailout plan was and a... And CTA is broke again. I w it's exactly the point. <laughs> Which, by the that, way, I that, predicted that at the bail, time that happened. As did I. That, and I, would, I was on the phone with legislators. That, that bailout plan achieved the two principal objectives of the CTA, which are always these. A, more money. B, less accountability. That is the CTA agenda, and unfortunately, we've got three Republicans who ratified that agenda to their own detriment and to the detriment of regional transportation in but, this region. But it, it goes beyond that. You talk about the uh, influence of the leader.